Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. He has a Bachelor and Master of Science uh, degree from, in uh, experimental and theoretical physics from the University of Cambridge, UK. And he's currently in the uh, PhD program of uh, Applied and Computational Mathematics at Princeton University. So this all sounds too, almost too theoretical for a practical group like my group, Systems Management Group, which try to solve the registry problem, spyware problem for your daily machine management business. But in the past two years, he has formed a small company working with uh, MSN and other uh, consulting companies in applying his expertise in data mining and machine learning to very, very practical business problems. And he's going to talk about that in the first part. And surprisingly, the way that we manage people leaving our um, MSN business, joining our uh, customer, joining and leaving, is very similar to the machine is about to fail or not. Okay, so that's where I get really excited about. So I'll let uh, Ali talk about that. Hi, everybody. Quite a lot of you probably will think I look quite familiar. I think I hold the record for being MSR's longest serving intern. Um, but I'm, I'm, I've heard, also heard that that record is under threat. Um, <laughs> so I just wanted to give you a quick overview of what I'm not going to talk about and what I am going to talk about. A majority of the time that I spent here um, as an intern was working on the core of my thesis work, which was um, using quantum mathematics for global optimization in a, a desktop computing environment. Um, I spoke at MSR about this work in September of OT. And uh, since then, I've had more demonstrations that it works, but it can be very complicated. I've also pr proven that there's no um, classical equivalent to, to this algorithm approach. And I'm happy to talk about that in the interview process. Today, I want to focus on two things. Firstly, um, bringing my background actually in machine learning and data mining to very real, practical, valuable business problems. I want to talk to you specifically about work my company has done with MSN, both um, MSN's acquisition and retention team through their data sciences team, and then some very simple work that I've done with uh, MSN's market research group, understanding customer satisfaction. <clears throat> and secondly, I want to talk about, um, I think, the work I'm probably best known for in the machine learning community, which is uh, the non-negative Boltzmann machine. Before I begin on that, I wanted to kind of give you my impression of how what I'm talking, going to talk to you about today relates to systems management. And that is in the context of building a self-managing, self-healing distributed system. And to do that, what you really need to do is the two things I'm here to talk to you about. Firstly, you need to identify in advance patterns of registry changes or system events that are likely to lead to a crash. What that means is you need to structure and view a large amount of accumulating data and you means accumulating a lot of system trace data um, in a way which reveals underlying patterns in failing systems from a multiplicity of individual configurations. That's recognizing that there's a huge universe of possible ways to configure a system and you want to find the underlying patterns which lead to the small amount of events which cause crashes. <clears throat> also you want to identify commonality with known working and failing configurations. And that's work Yimin has begun with his peer pressure and strider initiatives. Um, and also, th there's an idea which is going to come up in what I'm going to present to you related to MSN Internet Access about life cycles. And the point I wanted to make here is that it's the same kind of problem with the system registry and, event and system events, in that there's a life cycle for a crash. And all this I view as being data mining. And secondly, you need to be able to determine which specific system changes and events are most likely at fault in a given instance and repair them recoverably, so in a transactional process where you can get back to where you started from. And that means that you need to determine what is most likely at fault, and that lends itself to probabilistic analysis in a way that a lot of people here are very specialized in. And the problem is also that you need to generalize from a very limited specific examples because you can't view the whole universe of uh, candidate pr 
problems. And you need to identify all problems of the same class from this limited set of specific examples. And that's about what I call learning a generative model for, for system faults. And this is really machine learning. So back to what I am going to talk about. Uh, my company has done work not only for MSN, but for American Express, uh, the Seattle Times, the Transportation Security Administration, um, Walmart, Black & Decker, quite a lot of large uh, customers over the past few years. The piece of work that is very easy for me to talk about um, in terms of being free to give you all the details is the work I've done pretty much constantly for the last 18 months with MSN. And um, I'm going to embark straight into that. And this is joint work with uh, Jeff Snedden, Angus Cunningham, Nitin Gotham, Paul Smolikoff, and Laurie Stock in MSN Data Sciences and their MSN Acquisition and Retention teams. And uh, the business strategy side of this was done in conjunction with Novantis, Jim Meyer, Sarah Welsh, Phil Auerbach, their New York based uh, data driven management consulting firm. So, in summary, this work has kind of three aspects to it. Firstly, MSN has large databases of customer history data in terms of uh, customer support, uh, dial-up usage, and subscription history and type data. And the first thing that we really needed to do was over these several minutes, 4.9 million customers and declining, <laughs> um, is understand what the pain points are for MSN's end users and kind of bust these several hypotheses that exist in the marketing community at MSN about what it is that drives churn and facilitates cross-sell and upsell opportunities. Those particularly being lack of engagement with the MSN client software and lack of usage. A lot of people at MSN felt that um, they had this wonderful base of money yielding customers who pay their subscription and never use the service. The second part of that is, once we had found out the pain points, the drivers of, of these behaviors, was to understand how they fit into the subscription life cycle. Um, and this is an interesting problem, which uh, actually is, is kind of novel, in that with mo running monthly subscription plans, you don't have this kind of contractual obligation to the service. So an example is with wireless carriers who have a similar kind of problem, they know that they've tied you in to a year-long or two-year-long contract. And hence, they know when your contract's coming up for renewal, they know that they need to kind of incent you or continue to sell something to you or sell you to somebody else. But in the case of a rolling monthly subscription, you need to be able to detect when it's coming to an end, when there's no fixed time scale for it. <clears throat> and this brings in the concept of a standardized or normalized customer life cycle. And then understanding the um, contents of this life cycle allows you to determine behavioral triggers so that you can use to prompt communications or actions that you perform with the customer. And the third piece, once you've identified the pain points and the behaviors that happen and put them in the context of where they appear in the subscription relationship, you need to, well, you'd like to try to improve your ROI by better targeting how you invest in contacting and monetizing the customer. And so to aid that, what um, the teams I've been working with have produced is customer level look ahead predictions of churn propensity, broadband upgrade propensity, and um, expected tenure or long term value. And this is the idea of uh, when a customer calls MSN to cancel, they have what they call a save program, where they, it's the same with your credit card, you call to cancel your credit card and they try and incent you to remain a customer with them. MSN has this kind of program, um, and what we found was that a lot of money was being wasted on it. We were able to improve that a great deal. And then by understanding the drivers of this model, we are able to power building real um, business strategies around these models, and that's actually happening right now. So I want to talk a little bit about the problem, the insight that led to the standardized life cycle. Yes? Um, did you attempt to 
at all deal with any uh, feedback that people gave or did you infer churn information from date say join date say when time slip called and stuff like that did people did you actually look at customer complaints as one of the features that yeah well the um, I can tell you in detail all the variables we use, but um, MSN basically collects a record of all customer support incidents and categorizes them by various types. And there are certain free text fields which can describe very specifically what those problems were. <clears throat> and this actually quite complicated um, picture is uh, in re by reference to the number of months since sign up, the uh, relative number of customer support incidents and the color shading is by type of incident um, and this is this plot isn't specifically about understanding all these different color gradations in here it's about seeing that you give, get a very co-mingled view of the data if you look uh, at it relative to the time that you sign up with MSN because what you've got in here is people who this is for all inactive customers what we've got in here is people who lasted for who had a lifetime of three months with MSN, signed up and three months later cancelled. You've also got people who signed up and then nearly three years later called and cancelled. You can't see any consistent call type patterns in here. So well, okay, let's flip it around and this is kind of the traditional way to look at things from a predictive modeling perspective. Let's flip it around and look at people's call behavior, uh, customer support behavior in the months leading up to cancelling. So zero here on this scale is the point at which you call and cancel. And again, these colors are the same call type groupings. And this gives you a little bit of insight. Um, this orange color here is the number of cancel calls are increasing as you come to the end of the lifetime. But it's not very powerful because you have the same problem that people with multiple tenure lengths start at different points in here. So you can't see if there's a consistent underlying pattern because you're constrained by the fact that there's a very real time scale. Sorry, is the left-hand graph, is that, is that the number of calls for the first one canceled at that time or the number of calls at that time? Yeah, this, this is for all inactive people, so it's for, only for people who cancel. So what I'm saying is the bar at 20, the number of calls for people who cancel at 20 months or the number of calls at 20 months for people who cancel? Number of calls at 20 months for people who subsequently canceled. That's normalized by, it's not normalized at all, right? So that this is just, you know, we're looking at things way out on the right-hand side of that, that that could be small just because for a few people have been around that many people. Right? That's exactly, exactly. So this is exactly the problem. There's no, there's no information. That's why the one on the right is from the right. Yeah, okay. yeah. The key point is that neither of these are particularly informative. <laughs> I think everyone kind of gets that. So the answer, the answer, simple answer is, well, you, you normalize people's lifetime. And that is, map on a scale from 0 to 1 everyone's life. So you kind of time warp them. This guy has five months of tenure. This guy has four years of tenure. You map them onto the same time scale. And it's just linear. <clears throat> and that makes a huge difference in what you see. This is basically an identical plot to the two I was showing you, same information but viewed on this standardized life cycle. And what you see here begins to bring out several key points. Firstly, right at the beginning of the lifetime, people have this initial, bur initial burst of installation related contacts. And secondly, 75% of all customer support incidents actually occur during the last 10% of the user's life. So, huge flag. If someone calls, they're really likely to be leaving you soon. And this was not known at MSN prior to this point. And then thirdly, that looking at the calls by type, this dark red is connection-related calls. And these get rep, end up representing 48% of all calls in the last 10% of the relationship. Yeah. 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 What's PS and what's customer support and technical support? Okay, which are customer originated and are there any Amazon originated calls that you keep track of? Um, yeah. Sorry, I can't fix that. We do, but not from the perspective of 
these measurements. The aim is to kind of power, empower the contacts that you make with the customer. So um, moving forward, they're beginning to measure what is the impact of various contact strategies that they're using based upon this to kind of close the feedback loop. Is there a point in here slide talking about uh, how this compares to the data for customers who didn't cancel? Um, in fact, it's very, it's very similar. It's very similar. Um, I don't actually have a slide on that. But um, basically what happens is uh, as you look at snapshots of uh, increasing tenured people, the longer the tenure you find, the closer they are to this point. So basically when you look at people who haven't already cancelled, you see the same kind of distribution. <laughs> yes? Um, yes. The, um, it's twenty one ninety five, and the cost of goods is seven dollars thirty five cents. Um, the question is about what about the mar all the marketing overhead, and that's kind of what we've been trying to improve with this work. <clears throat> um, and then, using this kind of insight, been able to build some very good predictive models and. We've been using the SQL Server Econ tools because we've been able to deploy this very easily on the whole customer database and score this whole series of models. So we actually built four different models, one for voluntary churn, that means customer-initiated churn, another for involuntary churn, which is Microsoft-initiated churn, another for broadband upgrade propensity, and another for this tenure after save. Um, and they all have very good accuracy. And that's good. I can drill into the technical details of this, but I figured that the findings are the most, were actually the most important. Um, having built these decision tree predictive models, um, we're able to analyze the key drivers using the dependency network tools and viewing the splits in the decision trees that we built. <coughs> with voluntary churn, we identified that basically lack of engagement with the service is kind of your cause of death. <coughs> if you don't use, you don't have an up-to-date version of the MSN client software, and you've had some CS incidents and a lot of connectivity issues per what we found in the lifecycle analysis, you're very highly likely to churn voluntarily. These models were based on um, a total of 150 uh, variables, which we passed down to basically about 25, which are really driving the model. Um, involuntary churn basically boiled down to people's credit cards are expiring and they're not renewing their details. So it's a very easy business strategy around that. That's send people an email or even a written mail reminding them to update their credit information. And MSN is now making a very good job of that. <coughs> Broadband upgrade. Um, the key flag that wasn't really present in the voluntary churners is that uh, if someone had used the dial-up accelerator, which kind of interested, uh, suggested they were more speed hungry, that they uh, were much more likely to want broadband. And also unresolved customer support incidents, so things which couldn't be fixed, particularly connectivity issues, very easily resolved by upgrading to a more reliable provider. So how do you know the broad, those are uh, due to the broadband upgrade? So Is it use the Microsoft uh, MSN broadband, or you know, some people can just simply cancel dying die, die and then what? go to... Horizon, for example. Good question. What we did was we analyzed um, MSN dial-up subscribers from the past who lived in a Verizon DSL area and had upgraded to a Verizon broadband with MSN. So those are the, were the customers that we could use to create a dependent variable for that model. But the negatives, how do you know the negatives also didn't just use like cable modems or... That's a, that's a problem. That's a problem. We did actually build a um, another model which wasn't very good for this reason that you can't we couldn't actually see a lot of these people was for um, pushing the um, MSN for broadband product on people who didn't live in a um, Verizon area. We thought had broadband and we could and were engaged with the MSN client before. Because of the problems of actually getting a, a clear dependent variable for that, wasn't very successful. So there is a clear limitation to this. Did you look at any kind of 
competitor issues at all in other people's plans and how? There is an initiative going on with that at present, but it has been somewhat distinct from this work. I think they'll be integrating it kind of later. But what are the lift numbers? What do they mean? Oh, <clears throat> the lift chart is if you were to target a marketing campaign at somebody and you couldn't afford to market to 100% of your customer base, if you could target 30% of the population, uh, what percentage of the voluntary churners could you get? So this number is I could get find 88% of the high likelihood voluntary churners by targeting 30% of my subscription base. This is about marketing economics, really. Um, and then thirdly, uh, for tenure after save, and this again is about trying to decide who to invest your talk time in and your incentive money in when they call you to cancel. Um, this was greatly driven by people's kind of inertia. The longer you've been with the service and using it actively, the more likely you were to be able to be persuaded to stay. And also our good friends, the customer support incidents and the connectivity issues. And then this second point, which is a kind of another measure of inertia, so often when you sign up for MSN, you get two months or six months free, or you pay for six months up front and then you are monthly. What we found is that the length of time you'd been with the service beyond when your incentive or your small commitment was over also kind of provided inertia and loyalty to the, to the brand. What was your <coughs> predictable variable for that model? Um, for this model, it was people who had been, uh, who had had a call to cancel, and either were or were not subsequently saved. Saved. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> so, kind of what I've told you is that analyzing the variables driving the models yielded insight into root causes of churn, broadband upgrade, and tenure after save, <clears throat> and also involuntary churn. But it was ended up really just being about the one variable. Um, and you can combine the outputs of these models to assemble kind of distinct groups or segments of customers which you would want to treat differently either by um, selling them their list of names to a partner or communicating with them proactively or not bothering to talk to them when they call to council. <clears throat> and that's what MSN builds a complete business strategy around. Hi Max. I have a little breakdown of the save economics coming up. <clears throat> um, on this slide, in fact. Um, and so this is kind of going to be my little back of the envelope calculation that uh, we were able to increase the value of the save program and actually generate additional revenue using these models. And that's kind of in progress right now. Um, <clears throat> and so basically, on average, we were able to extend the tenure after save for the people that we subsequently attempted to save by nearly a month. And that resulted in a 39% increase in gross margin from those customers. <clears throat> so these are the economics were in, which were in existence prior to the end of last year. <clears throat> and uh, so people on average, after you saved them, lasted for 2.6 months. The average is the mean or the median? That's the mean. That's the mean. You're not getting very many really long ones. No. Or, or is it the case that, that the really long ones are still around, and so have it, you don't know the number and they haven't contributed? That's true. That's true. That is true. Well, yes, it does buy us the results. Um, the other pro uh, problem that we were having in this setting, there were two key problems in this setting, and that is, uh, firstly, uh, MSN was incenting its call center vendors to save people. And so... What we were finding is that there were records in the billing system of people who had been saved, but actually their account was cancelled the same day. <laughs> and uh, secondly, there were people who were gaming the system by taking a one-month cash credit to their account and calling back as a save and calling back the next day and getting that as a refund. So they were making. <laughs> so there were some householding things which really needed to be done here. Um, but basically. Um, this is the incremental margin for 2.6 months of tenure with MSN. Um, you have to subscribe, subtract the cost of talking to these people to, to try and 
convince them to save, and then there's an incremental cost for the incentive you're offering. So we have a $23.51 um, incremental margin. With a new, sorry? So does, does that first number include the gaming you were talking about where people cancel the next day? Yeah. Okay, so your 3.5 excludes those people. That's right. How much of the difference is due to getting rid of all the zeros? Um, it's about 40%. Uh, um, so with the new save economics, yeah, about 0.9 of a month longer. So an increase in the incremental margin after the cost of goods. Um, the cost per save incident went down because a lot of people who were, who were previously coming in to save were just being cancelled with a few touch buttons and never speaking to somebody. They had a low um, predicted future tenure. <clears throat> the incremental cost for the incentive was the same, but we increased the incremental margin by about nearly $11, $10.50. Um, the other things that MSN has been doing with these models is uh, combining list of high propensity voluntary channels with high broadband propensity customers. It's being sold to MSN's broadband partners, in particular um, Verizon in the US and uh, Bell in Canada. And for high channel propensity customers with low broadband propensity, a specific contact strategy has been developed uh, to drive engagement with the MSN features. Remember that was a key finding we had, but basically people who weren't engaged with the software and the service um, <coughs> were, had a very high propensity to churn. Um, there's a large MSN initiative around proactively getting people to update their credit card information. Now I want to talk about um, <coughs> something very simple, but which actually has a very high impact uh, on MSN's portal business. And this is work that I've done with MSN's market research team. <coughs> uh, Mick McWilliams, Deepak Agarwal, and Bob Fulon, and Scott Feiner from Comscore Networks. And that is, does customer satisfaction re reflect business performance? And this is in the setting of the MSN.com portal. Um, so kind of some background on this. Steve Ballmer has kind of requested that everybody report their customer satisfaction company-wide. And that's kind of indiscriminate of what your product is. And so MSN has diligently been conducting portal satisfaction surveys across brands using Comscore. Comscore is a uh, surveying firm who has a large panel of um, customers who agree to have a small agent sat on their machine monitoring their um, internet usage behavior. And they have very, very rich um, behavioral data that you can unify with um, survey respondents. And uh, so we were able to use this to investigate the relationship between what people say about satisfaction and what that actually means from the perspective of the MSN portal, where it's not really clear what satisfaction actually means. <coughs> so we used Comscore to append online behavioral data for each respondent to the satisfaction survey. And this satisfaction survey was conducted for AOL, MSN, and Yahoo. And we investigated this relationship between satisfa stated satisfaction and present and future behavior. What do you mean by you for AOL and Yahoo? Comscore, being an independent vendor, has um, people in their panel who primarily use the AOL portal, who primarily use the Yahoo portal. So you can get competitive information. <coughs> Um, MSN asked three standard satisfaction questions, and this is more for definition than um, to be recalled in detail. But basically, how satisfied are you on a four-point scale? Um, how likely would you be to recommend your primary portal to a friend or colleague? And uh, how likely is it that you'll be continue to using to be using your primary portal six months from now? <coughs> and uh, what they found is that basically willingness to recommend is the most powerful um, measure of satisfaction. I always uh, kind of think of the analogy with telling somebody about a movie you've seen. Well, yeah, it was okay. Well, do you think I should go out and rent it? Mm, well, I don't know about that. It's kind of a more forceful thing because there's a trust relationship involved in that statement. <clears throat> um, MSN has defined this three-category um, measure for willingness to recommend, which is called net promoter. And uh, so basically, the bottom two boxes is detractor, uh, second two is neutral, top box is a promoter. 
so someone who promotes MSN. <coughs> Why does the first question have four answers and the other two have five? <laughs> That's a market research thing. They try and force people to distinguish between rather than sit in the middle ground. But they don't care on the other two. <laughs> right. <laughs> so just any even number of questions for the board, or any even number of responses for the board. Just trying to avoid one to five, one to seven. <clears throat> so just reminding what these things are. There are some key business questions related to these groups. People who would not recommend you, do you invest in making them happier? Are people who are neutral, are they actually okay and they're not going to do much in terms of changing how, they, how their relationship with you works? Are they brand loyal? And should we spend money keeping the promoters happy or making the neutrals kind of happier? The way we investigated that was <clears throat> we, the survey was conducted in November of 2003 and it's been done again in April. We're analyzing that now. Um, and we've joined that with monthly behavioral data for each of the survey respondents for the, from November through April. So for the subsequent, the present month and the subsequent five months. What we did is a simple factor analysis on the share of page views um, by the three portals we were interested in, which is AOL. MSN and Yahoo. <clears throat> and we identified a six factor solution. This is very max rotated, so you can see very easily what the factors are. And I've deleted things which have a low loading. Um, but there are three factors which are really about just being engaged with the different brands throughout the six months. And there are three factors which are about being engaged with the three brands just in the late months of the view that you were looking. The last two in the case of Yahoo and the last one in the case of MSN and AOL. What do you mean by engaged? Um, had a high, an in, a high share of page views. So your only behavioral input was the number of pages that you saw? Yeah. This was just to make it simple. We have thousands of variables in the console data page views, minutes, sessions, shares of um, clicks How did you run the others? Uh, exhaustively. <laughs> exhaustively. But that's an exponential problem. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't cover all the bases, but um, certainly for page views, minutes, sessions, and days visiting the site, we found that share of page views was the most powerful. Also, it's the one which is most uh, closely tied with business performance because page views and um, renderings of ads are directly proportional to each other. So this is looking at uh, the proje projection of people whose primary portal was msn.com, broken down by their net promoter score, and projected onto the first three factors, the AOL factor, the MSN factor, the Yahoo factor. And um, we found as detractors, these guys in blue, by the time they tell you that they, their primary portal, MSN, they're cheesed off with, they're already gone. They're using Yahoo actually more than they're using you. <clears throat> Promoters and neutral, neutrals make substantially more use of MSN, which is the portal they declared as being their primary portal, than they do of the others. That's kind of... right? Yes. So then the next question is, what about when we project onto the last three factors, which are more about what happens in the future? <clears throat> and this is, again, and I've neglected the late MSN factor because it doesn't figure much for people who, for which MSN was their primary portal. And what you see is that neutrals have huge loadings on using your competing portals in the late months beyond the survey. So neutrals are kind of very fickle. They can be convinced to defect from you very easily. They have a high propensity of being lost to, com to competitors in the future. This is very simple, but very important. <coughs> Turns out the neutrals are a very important group for MSN. They account for 52% of the unique visitors to the MSN portal. And a 5% decline in MSN's share of page views among this group yields a 10% decline in monthly revenue for ad revenue on the portal. And uh, that amounts for $24 million a year. 
Since the tracks are already lost to MSN, also they only account for 6% of the unique visitors to the MSN portal. It's kind of consistent with the fact that they just don't like you. <coughs> There's not much value in attempting to engage them. So the recommendation is that MSN needs to drive to convert neutrals into promoters. Now I want to uh, shift gears a little bit and uh, get to what I think I'm best known for in the machine learning community as my work on the non-negative Boltzmann machine. Can you sneak in one more? Yes, you can. Um, did you look at why people use Yahoo? Like maybe it's the Yahoo Mail, maybe it's the uh, other messenger or whatever. We're doing that right now, looking at um, satisfaction across multiple services within the same brand. Probably within the next few weeks, there'll be some interesting findings there. <clears throat> I want to talk about um, the non-negative Boltzmann machine. Um, I want you to consider the abstract problem of selecting the, the natural probability distribution. In fact, the, the least committal, the smoothest probability distribution, which matches certain statistics of your data. <clears throat> And this makes it a simple Lagrange multiplier problem. Um, so each, this is, represents each of your statistics that you want to match with a Lagrange multiplier. In the case of modeling just first and second order statistics, you just have to ensure that the probability distribution is normalized, that you match the mean and the cross-correlation matrix of the data. <clears throat> In the case that your data is just continuous and unbounded, uh, this probability distribution is just a Gaussian. Everyone knows that. For binary data, it's a Boltzmann distribution with quadratic energy. Um, and this is the probability distribution which is learned and explored by a machine learning construct called the Boltzmann machine. <clears throat> the Boltzmann machine learns the maximum entropy probability distribution of binary data based on its first and second order statistics. <clears throat> What I considered in this work is the problem where you happen to know that the data you have is bounded to be non-negative. <clears throat> and in this case, you have a similar functional form for your probability distribution, but it's actually very different. It's zero everywhere outside of the non-negative orthant, and it has this functional form everywhere inside the non-negative orthant. I'm going to show you a picture of this to make it easier to understand. <clears throat> what this means is that the probability distribution can actually look like this. It can have more than one peak, which is totally different to a Gaussian. Remember, we've just embodied this one constraint that you know the, ba the, the data you're modeling is non-negative. Basically, what it means is that the, the matrix A, which for a Gaussian would be the inverse covariance matrix of the, ma of the data, can be um, non-positive definite. And this is the example I'm showing here. So the question is, um, how do we learn a non-negative Boltzmann distribution for a particular set of non-negative data? And uh, what we did was, uh, this was original joint work with uh, David Mackay and Dan Lee. Uh, Dan Lee was at Bell Labs at the time, David Mackay at Cambridge, um, <clears throat> was to learn, look for the maximum likelihood parameters, the most likely parameters given the data, under the assumption that the probability of the data given the parameters is the non-negative Boltzmann distribution. <clears throat> and to do that, we simply maximize the log likelihood on the parameters A and B. And we did that using gradient ascent. And taking the gradients of, the, of this log likelihood on the parameters gives you two simple learning rules. And anyone who knows the Boltzmann machine, which is for binary data, will recognize these very well. And this is the <coughs> uh, cross-correlation matrix for the data minus the cross-correlation matrix from the model. This is the mean of the model minus the mean of the data. And the problem here is that you have this distribution now, which isn't a complete Gaussian, so you can't solve for these statistics of the distribution determined analytically. Um, so the ways ahead are you can integrate numerically, you can make a mean field or variational approximation, <clears throat> or you can use Markov chain Monte Carlo methods to compute these statistics. So 
So why wouldn't you numerically integrate? Well, I showed you the one picture in two dimensions where the distribution has two peaks. In general, you could imagine a, a pathological distribution which has an exponential number of peaks in the dimensionality of the space. Was there a question? No. Okay. Um, so it's very hard to integrate for these statistics numerically. Secondly, you can use a mean field approximation, and that allows you to analytically approximate solutions for the parameters of the model. But what that boils down to is assuming that this is assuming an approximate model density which is factorizable. And that has a big problem for this model because it forces the probability density to be unimodal, single peaked. So you're trying to model a multiple peak distribution with a single peaked one. So the best solution was to use Monte Carlo sampling. And that's actually generating a, a set of data which looks like it came from the probability distribution that you have. And you need to do that, you need to de develop a dynamics which asymptotically produces samples which look like they came from the distribution. To do that, the dynamics need to satisfy detail balance, which in some sense is reversibility. And for the non-negative Boltzmann distribution, this is simplified by the fact that if you take a one-dimensional slice through the distribution, it looks like a chopped-off Gaussian. And uh, the log likelihood is just a quadratic function. The method that was most applicable and at the time was, was new and hadn't actually been used in any specific problem before was Radford Neal's slice sampling. And we were able to use reflective slice sampling. Um, this, the dynamics goes as follows. You have your unnormalized distribution. You pick a point at random in the space. And you know the unnormalized height of the distribution at that point. You pick a point between the floor and the top of the distribution at that point at random. And you use it to define an enclosed slice in the den through the density, probability density. And then, starting from the point that you, you picked, you bounce around at random in this slice. And this is what I'm showing here. Until you've covered a fixed path length. And you use the point at which you stop as your next candidate for a sample from the distribution. On this slide, what I'm comparing is, I know it looks weird because it's a function versus samples, these closed contours are the contours of a mean, naive mean field approximation to this distribution. They have a single peak. They don't look anything like the underlying colored contours of the non-negative Boltzmann distribution. This is just 200 slice samples uh, created using the slice sampling algorithm I just described. And they're pretty much confined to the peaks of the distribution. So how can we use this? Um, what we built was a hierarchical, non-negative structure um, for generating prototype human face in images by combining the non-negative Boltzmann machine with a non-negative matrix factorization. <clears throat> and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. So the structure looks as follows. We have a non-negative Boltzmann machine measuring the correlations between a set of features which project into the visible space. The visible layer is uh, grayscale images. And the kind of insight behind that is that if you had a photograph, the pixel intensity could be zero or some very large high number. In the case of computed images, we know that's upper bounded, but this is beyond the range in this case. <coughs> um, and the matrix. Of the weight matrix W represents this a non-negative decomposition of these face images. And it produces a basis similar in how you would use it to PCA or singular value decomposition or vector quantization. But um, qualitatively, it's very different because it's bounded to be non-negative. So what this is is an additive decomposition of the components of a face. <coughs> And I said, we use the non-negative Boltzmann machine to model the correlations between features in this basis set. 
What I've said so far about this has been pretty abstract. I'm hoping you can see this okay. This is a non-negative matrix factorization basis for a database of face images. <clears throat> and what you can see we have in here are noses, pairs of eyes, mouths. An interesting thing is that these are kind of qualitatively the additive components of what you would describe as making up somebody's face. And what we're trying to learn then with the non-negative Boltzmann machine is what are valid combinations of noses, mouths, eyes that go in to make up a plausible face. <clears throat> On this next slide, what I'm comparing is modeling the correlations in the upper layer of that model here with a Gaussian or with a non-negative Boltzmann machine. On the left, you have faces generated from training a non-negative Boltzmann machine to model these coefficients. And on the right is what you get if you train a Gaussian to model those correlations. So you can see the samples generated from a non-negative Boltzmann machine are much more plausible face images. Yeah? I'm sorry, aren't correlations bounded from above and below? So how is it? Saying using non-negative books. Oh, yeah, the, the, there's nothing about bounding the correlations, just the activations of the features are non-negative. It's the one on the left that doesn't look quite right. This is a, this is sampling, so there are always some statistical outliers. Hi, John. Hey, what happens if you decided to just use? I mean, if everything is a positive orth, then why not just use log normal? Because what you get is a still a single peak probability density. So what would happen if you did that here? What you'd get is just a continuing sequence of kind of faces which deviate from the, of images which deviate from the average face. That might be okay because people like eigenfaces that are normally just in the, the, the... It might be, it might be. The, the, the answer is that, the, the kind of canned answer is that this is what you found is the natural distribution to match the first and second order statistics of the data, whereas the log Gaussian isn't in the sense of match maximum entropy. So in summary, um, bound, knowing that you've got data which is bounded to the non-negative orthant makes dramatic changes to the maximum entropy model of the data, and that's the non-negative Boltzmann distribution. <clears throat> the non-negative Boltzmann machine describes the framework for maximum likelihood learning of the non-negative Boltzmann distribution for a given set of data. Markov chain Monte Carlo methods can be implemented to sample the distribution, and naive mean field theory makes a very bad approximation at solving for the model parameters. You can develop an advanced mean field theory for this model um, using high temperature expansions, and that can kind of lead to almost good deterministic learning of the model parameters for a given set of data. Got through all this a little bit quicker than I thought, but what I've tried to give you, this is kind of, this is a two-fold position that I'm applying for here. So I've tried to give you some insight into very practical problems where I've produced very relevant, albeit somewhat simple, um, insights into very rich data which hadn't been looked at before. And uh, some of my experience working with um, Microsoft product groups, understanding the trade-off between academic details and efficient contributions to business performance. And I tried to give you some insight into my um, kind of core competency of machine learning. And I'm glad to talk to you about any questions. Any questions? You didn't say anything about the trade-off, really, did you? No, I just made the trade-off. <laughs> uh, what, what surprised me was that these things hadn't been looked at at all before, and you didn't have to get very advanced to find things which were surprising and new for the customer. And that was very valuable. I'm sorry, I came in the middle. Can you draw any analogy from your stuff about rec uh, recommenders and avoid of NSN to the current uh, election, whether party should energize evangelical Christian and the trade unionists or go for the people? <laughs> 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 
right right now. Both <laughs> parties have their fanatical base and their um, wavers. <laughs> That's true. Then they have the wavers in between yeah. the neutrals. Good question. If you had the data, you could certainly do it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I just want to go back a little bit to that one question I had where you were saying a 0.9 month increase in the... Yes. And uh, I, I, I had asked what percentage of that was just to do to get rid of the gaming. Yeah. So you said 40%, but that's actually also the same number as the increase between the two. Are you saying 40% of that point? No, no. 40% um, of the increase in incremental gross margin can be attributed to okay. those people. Well, it's just a coincidence. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.